Baba, Manto Vetabelate. This is everybody's day. This is everybody's day. Whosoever. We came into a supply in the city of Lagos. You know, while I was trying to raise my prayer point, Prophet A.T. Joel came into the meeting. So, I know when prophets come, and his kind of prophet we never met before, I've just been seeing him around. I was feeling, let prophet not feel that. How am I to the day? Until he now began to teach, he now looked at me, now said, Apostle, that, that your prayer point. That's the only prayer point we prayed in the school of prophets. His story was that when he got to the school of prophets, he came with quite some doctrinal persuasions. And so he didn't see sense in praying for Holy Ghost that you have. Why you tell God to give you, that the prayer point was just one prayer point. Give me the Holy Ghost, give me fire, let them dwell in me. Give me the Holy Ghost, give me fire, let them dwell in me. So for the first one month, once he raised that prayer point, he stays in the corner and out of his own doctrinal reserve, he begins to pray for the things that he needs for ministry. Until one day, I approached one of the senior men who was also a student in the school of prophets and said, what, what's our problem? There are many things to pray about. And the man said, see, see, see. I have been in this school of prophets for 14 years and that's the only prayer point I've been praying every day. For 14 years. <laughs> Meanwhile, men are in sizes. I've said so much. I told my wife yesterday. Men are in sizes. Every man must know what is good at. But when you meet people who have what you don't have, don't be anyhow. Give me the Holy Spirit. Because you trust that I will not mislead you, I want you to ask the Lord. Just say it where I'm saying, give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the Holy Spirit. Give me the Holy Spirit. All right. If you're watching online, don't switch off. You will need to pray this prayer. Luke chapter 11 from verse 9 to 13 is where we'll glide from. Jesus was building a was building an edifice in knowledge. So if you study Luke chapter 11, it was like um, a construction works that Jesus was trying to establish. One that was supposed to furnish his disciples adequately on God's concept of prayer. In the ninth verse, because I don't want to go from the beginning, but that's the sense. He said to them, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. So the ninth verse of Luke chapter 11 is actually a replication of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Are you with me? Good. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open to you. So there are hidden things, and in approaching hidden things, you must seek them out. There are available things but they are restrained from those who need them. And so their availability must provoke an asking. Are you with me? There are also things that are hidden behind doors in God. And the way to approach God when you find out that these things are locked behind doors is that you, what it means is that the things are available, but access to them has been denied. What you do is that you knock. All of those three protocols are protocols of prayer. You deploy them based on your consciousness of the technology of God 
that has kept that thing from you. Are you with me? So that's why you need wisdom of the spirit. When you get into general prayer waters, many of us don't feel that we need the Holy Ghost. But when the Bible says, likewise, the spirit helpeth our infirmities, and the reason is because we do not know what to pray for as we ought. It means that there is a wisdom that delivers your request. And that wisdom is not given to you. So you will need to ask for the spirit of prayer. Who does not only supply prayer capacity. Who does not only supply prayer intensity. He also supplies the wisdoms for prayer. It is the Holy Spirit that searcheth all things, even the deep things of God. So when he begins to search, he unveils to you the wisdom that has kept the answer away from you. And then you know if it is an asking thing or a seeking thing or a knocking thing. Are you with me? Okay. Next verse. We're going to 13. Help me. Help me. Verse 10. Help me. The choir is ahead, so let's just flow. For everyone, so it comes an assurance. For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. I'm building gradually. In verse 9, did we read verse? Okay, verse 9. In verse 9, what I revealed was that you will be stuck in verse 9. In your attempt to pray, because you know the protocols, what you don't know is which one to deploy. It's like you're giving a manual gear system, and the only thing that your instructor tells you is that to change from one gear to the other, what you do is to depress your clutch, and when you have engaged that gear, you lift it up. You will still need wisdom to know which of the gears you need to deploy. Because you can think, ah, we need energy to overcome inertia. And so gear five is what will supply the energy. You know five is greater than one. Then you will now wake up after many years of being stagnant to find out that the lower numbered gears are stronger than the higher ones. So that even though five is greater than one, you will need one to overcome inertia. You may think, okay, if I need speed, if they say one is the great, is strongest, let me be using that one to run very well. Then you'll soon become a noisemaker. And the next policeman that stops you will most likely first ask, not for your license, but for your car particulars. Because he will think that you're a thief. Are you with me? It's available. But basic knowledge is what we bring to prayer. When we come into prayer, another school is unlocked. And it's unlocked every day in practicality that the Holy Spirit begins to teach you. So, what I'm saying is that what you see as an assurance, give me the 10th verse, in the 10th verse, it's not only built on the knowledge of the protocols of prayer, it's built on the help of the Spirit that helps you assess what protocol, so that when the Holy Spirit is your teacher, everyone that asks it, receive it. Everyone that seeks will find and to everyone that knocks, the door will be open because you are joining in prayer with a master. Are you with me? Okay. So Jesus finished part of his course on prayer in verse 10 and then he goes to verse 11, still under the same subject, but he begins to teach the shape of God that powers petition-based prayers. That's the face of God as a father. And because his audience could not readily assess the dynamics, that's the workings of the fatherhood of God, Jesus begins to address this issue from the standpoint of a natural father. Am I confusing you? I don't need all these details. I'm just trying to be as petty as possible. If you get prayer right, you will have gotten over one third of your labors in the kingdom accurate. Because if prayer does not stop, then there are supplies that cannot stop. Are you with me? 
what I spoke on yesterday is tied to the supply of the Spirit. And what Paul revealed to us, don't go to him. If I see it, I'll be explaining it, so don't go to him. In Philippians chapter 1, verse um, 19, is that no matter the strength of adversity, it will work out for your salvation as long as the saints are praying because the prayers of the saints will unlock what you call the supply of the Spirit. And I told them yesterday that what we call the supply of the Spirit is the generosity of the Spirit. You have not known the Holy Ghost as a generous entity until prayer starts. He will give you what you said you need. And when you, when you continue your journey, you'll find out that what you asked for was one thing. What he gave you were ten things because he will overgive you. That's what happens in prayer. Ah, help us. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, how does the Lord's prayer start? Our father. So what Jesus is attempting to teach here is the fatherhood of God that powers the enterprise of prayer, but he's teaching it from what they know in human fatherhood. Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? You know, they look alike a little. Fish is also long. It also moves like that. What do you want? Do you Bread and stone too look alike, have you? Yes, now. They are both solid, sometimes smooth. Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Jesus now said, if ye then be evil, and what he characterizes under being evil here, does not necessarily mean that you do bad things, that you are ungodly, unregenerated, readily available for the enterprise of Satan. If you are like that, and you will not for the request of a fish give a snake, a serpent, for the request of an egg, imagine that you, you serve your child in domain, you now put a scorpion with a raised tail on it. Or he says, I want to eat bread and tea. And you give him tea and stones. As readily available as the enemy as he are, you know how to give good. And the word good there suggests what is advantageous, what is beneficial, what is profitable unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Ghost to who? So we have a problem statement. Because foundationally the giving of the Spirit is not to them that ask Him. When you confess the Lordship of Jesus, it was subscription that gave you your first experience with the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Not asking. Two, if you look at how God was introduced in this verse of scripture, what was he called? If he had said the heavenly father will give, then we could have suggested that it was pre-salvation experience. But he said your heavenly father, it means you're already in the economy of God. You're already saved. It means you currently have the Holy Ghost. But Jesus is saying that in, in, in the context of that new relationship of God already being your father, if you ask him for, or ask him for the Holy Ghost, he will give you. So there is, this giving is beyond the first reception. I'm trying to build a case for my prayer point, which is what? Give me the Holy Ghost. Is there anybody here who has noticed some kind of infirmity? It might be 
natural sickness, disease. It might be spiritual. There is something that God has laid on your heart, something you have found in scriptures that you are laboring hard to attain unto. Anybody like that? Oh, how are the church of perfect people? Glory to God. The reason why you may not know is that in spite of the Holy Ghost that you have, he has not become the spirit of sight to you. So your perceptions are wrong. How many of you think that currently you pray as you ought to pray? How many of you think that your perception of God is as robust as you ought to have? How many of you won a soul last week? And in case you didn't win, because there are some souls that are difficult to win. May God give you understanding. How many of you attempted to win a soul? You, there was a flame that was burning in your heart. And that flame was towards soul winning. Talk to somebody about Jesus. How many people experienced it? Okay. What I just described are different kinds of infirmity. Brothers, how many of you beheld a damsel and your heart journeyed a little before you now remember that you are blood washed? You don't want to raise your hand. God bless you. Those who did not raise their hand most likely lied too. It means there's still a lying issue. I'm not trying to create same consciousness. I'm just trying to market that you see, we were saved to be dependent. Salvation experientially does not produce a perfect man. What it does that establishes the man who is saved on a journey of perfection. Are you with me? According to Paul's speakings to Timothy, one of the assignments of scripture is to bring a man into a place of thorough furnishing. He's already a man of God, but he needs to be furnished unto every good work. So the man of God is now subjected to the word of God so that by the word of God, he can be furnished. Are you with me? So, in case you have now stumbled on an infirmity, can you wave your hand? Meanwhile, when I spoke to them in the battle, the team was fire in my bones. And I found out that if you peep into Jeremiah's discourse in Jeremiah chapter 20, I'm trying to also use this opportunity to tell you to go and listen to the sermons. The book of Jeremiah began with his introduction to the prophetic dimension how God summoned him and the promises and covenants God made with him. And from Jeremiah chapter 2 to the end, it was a list, many prophesyings apart from verse 20 or chapter 20. Chapter 20 was the revelation of the humanity of the prophet. Lord, you gave me a word. I spoke the word, but I didn't end up sitting on a throne. I ended up in the prison. And then they began to say words to God that if you say now, People will say that you don't reverence him. You know, you must never greet the Holy Spirit. How are you doing now? May God give you understanding. <laughs> ah, he said, Lord, he said, God, you have deceived me. I know if it is God that is deceiving you, you can't beat deception. And I was greatly deceived. He said, because you gave me a word, I've become the mockery of everybody. And they mock me every day. And because of these things that are happening to me, I have made a decision. He said, my decision is that I will never make mention of you again. Two, is that I will never speak in your name again. He now said, but um, this is my resolve to live a compromised life became impossible. Because your word was shut up in me. It was like fire in my bones. You see, that I was weary. I tried to hold back, but I was wearied. And I told, to de told them that what Jeremiah was explaining was what David told us in Psalm 119. When he said, I word, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you? You think the word is only by instruction? There's an activity of the Holy Spirit that comes upon the word of God that even if you decide today that you want to drink, when you get to the gate of the beer parlor, you will go back home. The apostles knew it. 
What kind of prayer should they pray? We commend you unto God and unto the word of his grace. Grace there is not just unmerited favor. Grace there is supernatural ability. Unto him that is able to keep from falling. Those were the dimensions. So I know you know the Holy Ghost that interprets scripture. Do you know the one that acts on scriptures and produces the economy of resistance that keeps you from iniquity? If every man battling a sinful habit stumbles on that dimension, you know it will end now. Meanwhile, it's not another Holy Ghost. You have him already. So when we say, give me the Holy Ghost, it's, you are not asking for another entity. You are just saying, multiply your spirit to me. 